Uh, hi everyone, welcome. This is a lecture uh, that I'm going to call Context of Social Work Practice. It's intended to go along with uh, Social Work 506, uh, the second week of uh, material. Uh, so just a, a quick agenda here. Um, going to talk about sort of organizations, social work organizations in kind of a historical context and then introduce a little bit more terminology um, during this lecture. So we're going to talk about sort of what makes an organization a nonprofit. Uh, and then we'll talk about some characteristics of, of sort of a for-profit organization. Um, I'll, I'll introduce the Abramovitz podcast. Uh, actually, there's two of them, uh, which is also part of the, um, the sort of material for this week. And then just offer a few uh, concluding thoughts. So um, the, the very first social workers, you may remember this from, you know, a class on policy or, or a history of social work class or something like this. The first social work visitors, or sorry, excuse me, the first social workers were sort of friendly visitors. They were often the spouses of a wealthy industrialists who had some time on their hands. Um, and they uh, simply visited with people who were, who were less fortunate and attempt, attempt to coach them into um, sort of a, a better station in, in life. The, um, um, the friendly visitors phase in social work history was ultimately pretty short and um, sort of groups of, of what were then known as social workers started to sort of affiliate with themselves, sometimes with churches and re religious organizations. Those social workers who affiliated with, uh, with religious organizations uh, that form of charity was about advancing the mission of the religious organization. It was about doing good. Other uh, sort of loose associations of, of early social workers, um, you know, uh, form these associations to share resources, to make their resources go further, sort of unify their efforts, coordinate their efforts so that they were kind of uh, doing the same thing. And then excuse me, sorry about that. Um, some of the uh, earliest associations of social workers started uh, establishing training programs when it became clear that social workers sort of needed a, uh, a well-articulated procedure. Um, the first, uh, um, maybe not the first, but sort of the formal, um, the first formal, uh, one of the first formal um, social work organizations were known as charitable organization societies. And, and really the purpose of these was to extend the, relief, the reach of the relief that they could provide. They were also sort of early advocates of scientific charity. Um, and scientific charity was sort of a really early form of assessment. So that was, uh, we're only going to give, or we're going to give relief to people. We're going to target people for relief who are uh, most likely uh, to be helped by that relief. And we're going to um, uh, reduce or um, uh, uh, reduce priority for people who aren't going to be um, to be helped, uh, who aren't going to be able to be helped by uh, by that particular re relief. So really the, the point of, of me sort of making this slide was to to say that social work has always been kind of practiced in the context of some kind of organization. There, there isn't much in our history that, um, in the history of our profession, where social workers were sort of practicing independently. Um, very quickly, people discovered some of the benefits of, of sort of forming associations and organizations. And like I said last week, there are a number of benefits to, um, to uh, sort of social work organizations. And that's simply that it, you know, they uh, unify efforts, they coordinate, they offer a degree of coordination and, um, and they help to extend, uh, extend and, and target uh, resources. So these days, social workers, um, let me just put myself back down here. Um, these days, social workers tend to work in a couple of different domains of society. There's the public domain, the nonprofit domain, um, and occasionally and increasingly social workers are working in the in the private uh, for-profit domain. Now these are terms that you may have heard before. I just wanted to review them um, since they are sort of part of the, the organization uh, vocabulary. So public domain um, uh, public domain organizations typically are governmental organizations. Uh, the library, a public works department, a parks department, uh, child welfare organizations, um, those are all sort of public 
organizations um, because they're they're a branch of the government. Um, the nonprofit, uh, we'll talk about sort of the relationship between nonprofit and public here in a couple of minutes, but the nonprofit world is uh, typically an independent organization that has some kind of a social mission or a, uh, they're, they're advocating for some kind of cause. And we'll talk exactly uh, what about what nonprofit means here in just a second. The, the private uh, domain is also known as sort of the for-profit uh, domain. And so I was coming up with a couple of examples and you can sort of see what's on, on my mind. But, um, you know, any one of us could probably think of a, a few dozen sort of uh, private domain organizations. Um, you know, uh, Apple Computers is a is a is a. Uh, private domain organization, um, you know, Home Depot, uh, Wegmans, Tops, Perry's Ice Cream, Buffalo Bills, you know, uh, these are all sort of, of uh, uh, private uh, for-profit uh, organizations. And the thing that sort of uh, distinguishes a, a for-profit um, organization uh, is that uh, its purpose is to provide a, a service or a product in exchange for money and the money that that a person a consumer would pay uh, for that product or service is, is simply the price um, so for example um, you know Wegmans or Tops sells groceries right all these Trader Joe's whatever you know whatever you want to uh, whatever work, uh, sort of grocery store you want to think of right they sell uh, they sell a number of goods in exchange for a price um, there are lots of private uh, for-profit organizations that provide services. You know, IT consulting would be one of them. Um, you know, payroll, uh, the payroll management companies, that kind of stuff. Um, that's again, that's sort of service stuff. Uh, lawn mowing, um, uh, landscaping, that kind of thing. Right, all, all sort of uh, typically service stuff. Um, again, the goal here is really to make money for the owners or a shareholder. And a shareholder is, in at least for the purposes of this class, essentially the same thing as as an owner. It's simply the owner um, dividing up uh, different segments of her or his company and assigning them shares. And so people can buy varying number of shares to own uh, a varying percentage of, of the organization. Um, the price uh, of of um, that product or service um, is typically a function of the cost it takes to produce that product or service plus a little bit extra for for profit um, and and the profit is what the owner or the shareholders use um, to you know sort of pay for their lives right um, and the bottom line here is that when businesses make money, they can stay in business. If they can't make money, if they can't cover their expenses and provide en enough for the owner to live on, they have to close. Now, this is a huge oversimplification, um, and that's on purpose because that's partially because uh, the focus of this class is not really the for-profit world. You know, for-profit businesses have loans available to them. There's all kinds of things, you know. They have credit available to them. There's all kinds of things they can do if they aren't making money in an attempt to make money. But really the point of me uh, sort of pointing all this out it, um, is to contrast sort of the, um, the, um, the sort of cut and dry nature of the, of the for-profit world with the much more challenging world of sort of governmental services and the nonprofit world. So let's talk about what makes a, a nonprofit a, a nonprofit. Um, so nonprofits are typically mission driven. They're uh, trying to advance a cause, alleviate a social condition. Uh, they're trying to bring light to a certain, uh, a certain issue, which is essentially the same thing as advancing a cause. In the US, um, Nonprofits are tax exempt. Um, so, if uh, if hypothetically a nonprofit organization had a surplus of dollars, uh, instead of that surplus of dollars being uh, sort of profit for the owner uh, or shareholders, that surplus money is reinvested in the organization rather than rather than distributed. Now, it's kind of funny for me to say this because it's so rare 
that nonprofit organizations have a surplus of dollars. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, sort of how nonprofit organizations are funded here in just a couple of minutes. There's also typically no owner um, for a, a nonprofit. There's not there's not one owner. Um, typically, there's a group of, of stakeholders, and a stakeholder um, this is probably terms a term you've heard you've heard other places. But a stakeholder is anyone with some kind of investment in the organization's mission. Uh, that investment doesn't necessarily have to be financial. Um, it could be an investment in um, you know, sort of a, a, a health stake or a social stake. Uh, and so stakeholders are literally anyone atta attached or invested in that organization's uh, work and success. Could be donors, clients, workers, employees, other community members, regulators, um, employees of other uh, nonprofits, uh, family members of clients, so on and, and, and so forth. The, uh, the history of nonprofits is kind of an interesting one. Uh, and one that we won't spend a whole lot of um, uh, time on, uh, but in the U.S., nonprofits have um, kind of they they sort of emerged in this interesting space. Uh, they were taking up social causes that were either ignored or abdicated by um, by government. Let's talk about this word abdicated here for a second. If someone abd abdicates responsibility, they simply say, "I'm not going to be responsible for." Uh, whatever you know, whatever um, whatever need you have, and so there are um, obviously political differences in what the responsibilities of of governments are, and there are lots of times in the U in the history of the U.S. when governments have said that social issue um, isn't uh, a concern of the government, and so consequently, people formed nonprofits to. Uh, to sort of respond to that, um, uh, respond to that uh, that social issue. One of the sort of prominent examples, at least in social work, is child welfare. There were there were decades and decades and decades when um, governments at all levels said child welfare wasn't uh, wasn't a part of the purview of, of government, and so early social workers sort of took up the mantle of of child welfare. Um, Another example I can think of just off the top of my head, um, and because it, it has relevance to this class, is sort of worker safety. And so early, um, during the Industrial Revolution and, and sort of uh, early factory days, um, those, were, those were not necessarily nice places to work. Um, and it was really through advocates that the government decided that that worker safety was part of its responsibility, uh, but it was really the advocacy of of uh, social crusaders that brought that um, that work to the government itself. So at any rate, it, nonprofits have sort of an interesting uh, an, an interesting history, and as a result of the work they do, um, they're not responsible for uh, for paying taxes. That's the primary. Um, that's the primary thing that distinguishes nonprofits from from for-profit world. The for-profit world, of course, they have other um, they have other uh, sort of advantages as well. But the primary one uh, really is that if is that if there were surplus money, that's reinvested into the organization and not distributed to uh, owners or or, or shareholders. Um, let me. Let me just move myself again here. So nonprofit leadership is just something we'll spend just a second on here. Uh, typically, there's an executive officer of some kind. Um, they report, uh, that executive officer um, reports to a board of directors of some kind, but they're also balancing um, sort of reporting to regulators and stakeholders and occasionally com community advisory boards and, and things like that. Board of the, so the board of directors are ultimately responsible for the financial health of, of the organization. Uh, they sort of delegate day-to-day um, -day running and responsibility of the organization to that executive officer who then has, of course, people under her or him who do the day-to-day -day work and managing and, and sort of activities of, of that, that nonprofit. All of this to say is to say that nonprofits really have a complex metric for success. There's a lot of people invested in 
the work that they're doing, a lot of people who have a stake in the work that they're doing, and a lot of people who are scrutinizing them. So let's talk about where, where money comes from, um, at least in the nonprofit world and the, and the government services world, which are sort of the two, at this point, the two big domains of society that employ um, or that contain organizations that employ social workers. So money in the nonprofit world comes from donors uh, or fundraising, uh, comes from grants, and then it comes from uh, a fee for service. In the government governmental services world, the, the primary source of money is allocations from uh, state, federal, and, and local budget. And then there, of course, is some fee for service depending on the size of, of the government, the location, uh, um, that kind of thing. Typically, more rural governments have to take up um, uh, some of the, the fee-for-service stuff, mental health treatment or addictions treatment or something like that, that would be, um, uh, that would be sort of uh, fee-for-service kinds of, kinds of stuff. So let me just pause here real quick, though, and say, you know, we're, we're 16 minutes into this lecture, and maybe you've detected some of the things that, um, that are going to be sort of common themes throughout the course of this class. That is money, <laughs> uh, scrutiny, um, leadership, and, and management. And the, the whole point of this sort of lecture is to highlight the importance that uh, money and, and scrutiny have started to take on, um, or have, the importance that these things have started to um, uh, place on, on the delivery of, of social work services in, in the modern era. Some people would, um, would say that social workers are providing a public good. That's not entirely, entirely true. I at least wanted to uh, distinguish a public good and a private good real quick before we uh, move on in this lecture. So a private good is something that has to be bought in order to be consumed. And ownership of that private good is restricted to those who paid for that good. So examples I could think of, and again, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of examples that, um, that, that are out there. Uh, but a pizza is a good example of a private good. Um, you have to pay for it in order, in order to have it. Uh, a car, a sweatshirt, um, a computer, a cell phone, right? These are all things that are sort of, uh, sort of um, uh, private goods. Um, in fact, when you buy a car, there's a very formal transfer of title process. There isn't a formal transfer of title when you go and you buy a pizza, but um, there is a moment actually when you hand your money to the to the to the uh, the clerk and, and she or he hands the pizza to you that sort of the exchange of title is, is implied. One of the things that distinguishes a, a private good is that there's consequences if someone takes a private good without paying for it. So um, if, if, uh, if I stole a pizza, for example, um, you know, someone could, this is a little far-fetched, I realize that, but someone could call the police, right? If I, um, if I um, if I stole a sweatshirt without paying for it, someone could, someone could call the police, and there would be an intervention. Right? People would um, I would be in trouble for taking a private good without without paying for it. A public good, on the other hand, is is something that's available to everyone without um, regardless of of their ability to pay. So the the sort of um, the example that always comes to mind is is something like national defense or um, uh, clean water, uh, some, some access to, to green space, to parks and recreation. That's typically a, a public good. Public good, uh, goods are things that are really hard to price. Um, and, and they're things, um, that are, that are often extraordinarily expensive, like national defense is something that's, that's extraordinarily, uh, uh, expensive. And it would be hard to assign, uh, sort of individual units of, of national defense to individual members of, of society. Uh, so what we do is, as a society is we pool our money uh, in the form of taxes and we allocate some of that money to, um, to a public good like national defense. We allocate other forms of taxes to, to things like uh, parks, things like clean air, clean water, that kind of thing. Um, public goods are, are important um, 
because uh, they're a big part of what drives social justice. And so social, work, social workers are often interested in, um, in, in public goods. But uh, we don't always provide uh, public goods, although we do uh, do a lot of things that are really hard to provide, uh, or we do, excuse me, we do a lot of things that are really hard to price. So it, it's actually pretty easy to price a pizza, for example. Um, it, um, this might not be all that goes into sort of the, the, the profit or the, the price of a pizza, but uh, you could take the ingredients, um, you could, uh, you know, you could sort of measure them out and, and figure out how much flour and water and yeast and stuff like that goes into a large pizza, how much uh, pepperoni would go on it, how much cheese, so on and so forth. You could add a little bit for overhead, you know, the rent and the, um, the, the utilities and so on and so forth. You can throw in a couple bucks for delivery and then add a little bit more for, for profit. Um, people typically in the for-profit world have the ability to maximize profit by reducing their costs. So they could buy flour in, in bulk, they could buy cheese in bulk, right? Pepperoni in bulk, you know, whatever other ingredients would go on it. They could buy an oven that's, that's really, really efficient. They could buy a, a car that, um, you know, that's really, really efficient so that the cost of delivery is, is, is dramatically reduced. Uh, that means they can make more profit from a single unit of, of, of sales or a single unit of sales. They can make more profit from the sale of a single pizza. So the point of this is to say that, that private goods are typically pretty easy to, to price. Public goods are typically very difficult to price and social workers often do things that are really hard to price. So how do you price child welfare work? How do you price addictions treatment? I don't have the answer to this. It's extraordinarily hard to do, and there are people who are thinking about this kind of thing. This is to say, though, that our world, the social work world, is increasingly subject to these kinds of cost-benefit analyses. So when we price something, uh, it's it's really easy to do a cost-benefit analysis, right? If I if I sold a pizza for $10, but it cost me 12 or $15 to make it, I'd run out of money really quickly. And I could see that my, um, my, my cost to price ratio is way out of, way out of whack. And I've got to do something. I've either got to reduce the cost, my cost of the pizza, or I've got to increase the price so that I can, uh, so that I can turn a profit and, and keep my pizza shop in business. As I said, you can see what it is I'm thinking about right now. Um, it, it's, but this is to say that it's really hard to price a lot of the things that we do. However, we don't always provide public goods. And, and uh, as an example of that, our system of healthcare is private. It's privately run, it's privately financed, and consequently it's not a, it's not a public good. Now there are certainly social workers who are advocating for, um, for park space, green space, uh, for, uh, who are advocating for education systems and things like that. And so some social workers do provide um, public goods. But again, those things are also really, really hard to price. So part of the reason we're talking about price here and, and how challenging it is to, to assign a dollar value to social work, um, uh, to, to social work interventions, is that organizations typically have costs, um, and, and all organizations to some degree have costs. And the, the best example of that is really overhead, or organiz uh, overhead is what's known as sort of the cost of, of, of doing business. Uh, examples of overhead include things like advertising, um, rent, uh, personnel. Uh, you know, per personnel makes up things like salary and, and healthcare benefits, that kind of thing. Uh, taxes, supplies, um, maintenance, repair. I mean, there's there's tons of examples of of, uh, of of overhead. And nonprofit and governmental organizations have overhead as well. Um, and so that overhead needs to be taken into account in the, in the sort of price that, that we think about charging for our services. Um, there are, just as an aside real quick, there's sort of two types of overhead. There's fixed and variable. 
Um, fixed is the same, variable is different. So if we owned a, a pizza shop, for example, and, um, and maybe the cost of uh, one ingredient changes from month to month, it, you know, it's more expensive in the winter, it's less expensive in the summer, that would be an example of a variable uh, overhead, uh, overhead cost. Gasoline is a variable overhead uh, because the price of gasoline changes quite a bit. So if we're, uh, to use our pizza shop example, if we're um, putting gas in our delivery vehicle, we've got to take into account um, in the price of our product, the variable cost it takes to deliver uh, that, that product because the price of gas uh, changes day to day every couple of days. So there's a number of challenges confronting today's nonprofits, um, and, and sort of to summarize them at the highest level possible, uh, it, that's sort of what I've done here. So budgets are shrinking, requests for services are expanding, donations are, are shrinking as well. And perhaps most troublingly, there's increased uh, scrutiny and accountability. Um, as an example of the increased scrutiny and accountability uh, that, that social work organizations face, think about uh, one of the courses that you may have just taken, and that was evaluation in social work. I mean, you took an entire course on how to demonstrate accountability, how to study your own efforts or the efforts of you and your peers and, and demonstrate good outcomes. Um, there was a time when social workers really didn't have to do that, when, um, when social workers were sort of given a pile of money and it was assumed that the work that they were doing was, was good. But as, uh, as uh, people's willingness to pay taxes have decreased and as their, um, as their uh, sort of uh, uh, curiosity about where tax dollars are going has increased, uh, we've consequently found ourselves in this space where we have to be accountable for the kinds of things that we're doing. In fact, the, the parallel to think about it is, uh, to think about the accountability that social work organizations are facing is the accountability that our educational institutions are, are facing. Uh, people want to know what it is uh, schools are doing with all of that money and how we demonstrate sort of teacher success, right? And this has to do with the controversy over standardized testing, um, you know, what counts as, as good results, uh, so on and so forth. And it's extraordinarily difficult, uh, difficult to do. So to, um, to sort of further uh, kind of flesh out the, uh, the context of social work practice today, uh, we're going to listen to two podcasts from uh, Mimi Abramovitz. Uh, Mimi Abramovitz is, um, uh, she's at CUNY, I believe she's at Hunter College, um, and I believe she's been there for, for much of her career. And her, uh, her, the two podcasts that she recorded for the In Social Work podcast series from UB um, have to do with this idea of new public management. New public management wasn't an idea that, that she originated, but it was um, it came from an economist, I believe his name was Christopher Hill, in the 70s. Uh, but his idea was that government and nonprofits should fu function more like private businesses. Um, and so Mimi Abramovitz's idea is that uh, increasingly sort of business and for-profit uh, and capitalist thinking has infiltrated the world of Human services and and nonprofits, and we are increasingly being able uh, being asked to think in terms of dollars and cents when the outcome doesn't uh, really lend itself to uh, to dollars and cents. At any rate, there's a couple of features of new public management, and that has to do with management performance standards, um, metrics for for universe uh, for units of service meeting uh, you know sort of productivity standards and things like that this idea of decentralization uh, and then this idea that uh, that competition with the private sector is would be good for government and for and for nonprofits and so the question I'm going to pose here uh, and I don't have an answer to it I don't know that we'll actually come up with an answer to it during the course of the semester is uh, can can 
private sector social work services provide better than, than public or nonprofit sector. Um, I know that there are increasingly social workers working in the, uh, in the, in the, in the private sector uh, for for-profit businesses. Um, and, and we need to figure out whether that's a good thing for our profession or a bad thing for our profession and, and for our clients. Um, just a few uh, closing thoughts here. Um, so the, the two sort of big uh, things that have influenced uh, social work practice in the last 20 or 30 years are new public management, NPM, and this thing called managed care. Um, and we're not going to talk much about managed care um, except for, for what's here. Uh, managed care is simply a, a, a group of activities intended to reduce the cost of health care in the United States. Just a couple of examples of managed care are things like utilization review, cost sharing, that kind of thing. Um, um, networks, provider networks, preferred providers, that kind of thing. Those are other examples of managed care activities. And so these are the two big things that have sort of influenced social work practice in the, in the last 20 or 30 years. And they're things that we have to contend with uh, in, in sort of the provision of, of services in, in today's world. Um, so with that, I, I hope you enjoyed those two lectures or those two podcasts by Mimi Abramovitz. They are linked to you uh, on, on, um, on, um, uh, in, the week's, uh, in the week's content. As always, if you have any questions uh, or something's not clear, feel free to uh, get in touch with me. Thanks for watching.